In the name of the true and living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. If you wanted a river to wash in, you would not choose the Schuylkill, nor the Delaware most likely. Rivers are not for washing in anymore. Indeed, rivers aren't what they used to be, or at least they don't mean what they used to mean. Rivers today are often reminders of our capacity to ruin whatever it is that God has given to us. But in the biblical mind, a river is, if not everything, then almost everything. One of my favorite verses from the Psalms for sheer poetry and compact density of meaning is Psalm 46, verse 4. There is a stream whereof the rivers of God, there is a river, the streams whereof make glad the city of God. The creation story in Genesis 2 tells us that the river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. Of course, the people of Israel had to cross the river Jordan to make their way into the promised land, the same river in which many generations later, John would baptize Jesus. In Ezekiel's vision of God's healing and restoration, a river flows out from beneath the temple. And in the last chapter of the last book of the Bible, we read of the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. God accomplishes God's work by causing rivers to flow. God gives life by the currents of rivers. God fulfills God's promises when we cross the rivers that we must cross. And God gives new life when we are buried with Christ in the water of baptism, a river that makes its pools in fonts like ours and in churches everywhere all over the globe. A river is everything or almost everything. Most of us have been taught that the importance of rivers once upon a time, and maybe even a little bit today, was their role in enabling commerce and industry. And no doubt this is an accurate reading of history, but it is a partial reading of history, shaped by our preoccupation with the marketplace and its transactions. But faith, faith is supported by religion and religion is shaped by shared symbols of rich meaning. And a river, a river is not merely a byway of commerce and industry. A river is a shared symbol of rich meaning through which faith is conveyed. But these days, when we would not dare wash in the Schuylkill and when the Delaware is not what it once was to this city, we hardly know what a river is or what a river could mean. This was not so for Naaman, the, the commander of the Syrian army. Naaman knew what a river was and what a river was for. Naaman knew that how a culture, a people, a faith, and a religion could be described by a river and fed by a river. And Naaman was a great man in high favor with the king. He knew the importance of a river. And when he arrived more or less at the doorstep of Elisha the prophet, he was not expecting to be directed to a river. Rivers he knew in Damascus, the rivers of his own people, his own city, his own king. Naaman was not in search of a river to wash in. He had leprosy and he was in search of someone, anyone, who had the power to make him well. He was a man of power, and he was in search of power. Now, an interesting thing about this story is where the power is located. And if you look closely at the story, you see that power is never found where it ought to be found. To start with, we're told that through Naaman, the Lord had given victory, not to the children of Israel, but to Aram, which today we call Syria. God had given power, not to his own children, not to his own nation, not to Israel, but to Syria. We don't know why, but it's not where power belongs. It's in the wrong place, according to the scriptures. 
Next, there is the young girl who has been taken captive. Other translations call her a little maid. But let's be honest. She's been captured in warfare and forced into slavery. She is nothing. She is nameless. But God has work for her to do because she has power through God. And she could not otherwise have that power. It's this little, nameless, powerless maid who knows where healing is to be found for Naaman. And it's her intervention that gets the entire narrative going. Next, we see that the king of Israel already knows himself to be powerless. The only thing that he can imagine is that the Syrians are spoiling for another fight, looking for a pretext for more conflict in which they are sure to prevail. But the king of Israel, who's supposed to be on the right side of this book, the king of Israel is powerless. Elisha, the man of God, he knows that power lies within his own hands. But when Naaman arrives with his horses and his chariots, with all the trappings of his power, the man of God will not come out to see him. He sends a messenger, a powerless servant, to Naaman instead. In this story, power is never to be found where it is expected. Instead, power is nearly always found where it is not expected. Power is held in the hands of slaves and of servants and of messengers. Power is carried in the hands of the weak and the nameless. Nothing could make the message clearer to Naaman than to be told by some servant of Elisha's to go wash seven times in the Jordan River. Naaman flies into a rage as only men of power can do. Are you kidding me? He says. I will not be sent by some lackey to go wash in the River Jordan. Rivers I know, rivers I have. Rivers run through the streets of Damascus, rivers that make the Jordan look like a creek. Send that man of God out here. Have him call upon the name of his Lord. Have him wave his hand over the awful, flaking, scratchy, itchy, sickening skin of mine and have him cure my leprosy. I know what a river is and I don't need your river. Power, you see, doesn't always see no power when it sees it, especially power of a mystical kind that is often cloaked in weakness. And again, the story confuses us by locating power once again in the voices of the servants of Naaman who urge their master to calm down and reconsider and just try, maybe just try to do a simple thing and wash in the Jordan River as the servant of the man of God has directed him to do. And so, following not his instincts at all, so Naaman, who is a great man, much in the favor of the king, following the advice of his servants on a journey that had begun at the suggestion of a handmaid, of a slave girl, with only the instructions of a messenger of the prophet to go on, Naaman dips himself seven times in the waters of the Jordan, and there, in the river, he is healed. In the river, he's healed. God's power is not found where we expect it to be found, and we do not know what a river is for. Come with me now, all the way to the New Testament. Throughout St. Luke's Gospel, the evangelist tells us in detail of the movements that Jesus makes through the regions of the Galilee and in Judea and into Jerusalem. Now, I don't for one moment think that St. Luke intended it like this, but if you choose to read it this way, I wonder, I wonder if you could hear St. Luke describing Jesus' movements throughout all the regions where he enacted his ministry, if you could hear his descriptions of these movements as though he, Luke, is describing the course and the path of a river coursing through the Holy Land. 
the evangelist describes the path of Jesus' movements as he traveled. And if you were to draw those movements on a map in light blue ink, you know, the way they do on maps, then it might look something like a river as you trace Jesus' path here and there. Jesus goes to Nazareth and then to Capernaum. He flows into and out of a lake. He passes through grain fields, irrigating them. He flows into mountains and then back out again like a stream. He meanders during the course of his ministry into and out of villages, towns, and cities. He is moving, flowing, bringing good news of the kingdom of God with him. In chapter 9, St. Luke tells us that Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem, sending his messengers ahead of him, his course, his destination, his point of arrival is clear. It's not until chapter 13 that Luke describes again Jesus' progress, telling us only that he went on his way through towns and villages, journeying toward Jerusalem, just as he had set his face toward Jerusalem. In chapter 19, the blue line flow, flows, flows through Jericho, and then, later in that chapter, eventually, Jesus draws near to Jerusalem and weeps at the outskirts of Jerusalem. His tears, the only suggestion, the only hint, the only clue that he is a river flowing into the holy city. Back in chapter 17, St. Luke told us that on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going, flowing through the region between Samaria and Galilee, and then he entered a village where 10 lepers approached him. It's leprosy that links this story to the story of Naaman. And the people who make these decisions must have paired these two passages together for that reason, because of the leprosy. And it's that pairing that allows me, in my fanciful reading of the text of St. Luke's Gospel, to see Jesus as a river. No prophet has sent 10 lepers to the river, but the lepers have come to him nevertheless because they have heard of his healing powers. They come to the river of Jesus' love, and all they have to do is get close to be washed by the power of his grace. They are healed merely by coming into his presence. I don't know whether to belabor the point or to let it sit lightly, since it's kind of a kooky suggestion to say that Jesus is a river, river, I know this. But just as we hardly know what a river means anymore, so many of us don't know what Jesus means anymore. We struggle to see how God accomplishes God's work in sending Jesus to flow among us, how God gives life through Jesus, how God fulfills God's promises in Jesus, that the river of Jesus' love is nearly everything. Maybe it is everything. It would almost be easier if there was just an actual river that we could go wash in, the Schuylkill or the Delaware, anything. But it's not too much more complicated than that, as the 10 lepers found out. Jesus passes by a river of love and healing and grace passing by. And all you have to do, all they had to do was come near. That's it. That's all they had to do was come near and seek him out. And he will make you well as he made them well. You don't even have to be grateful for the gift. You certainly don't have to pay for it. You can have it for nothing. Nine out of 10 lepers do. And along the banks of his river, power, real power that transforms people in the world we live in, God's power is not to be found where power is usually located among the powerful, but with the nameless and the weak, with the sick and the poor with those who have been forced into slavery, with the servants and the messengers who are easily dismissed, disregarded, and ignored. So yes, it might be a little kooky to ask you to see Jesus as a river, but to me, 
considering the condition of the world that we live in, it seems hopeful to remember that a river can be almost everything. It sounds like good news to me that there is a river of love that we can still go to and find healing and grace. And that river is not a feature of geography, but a flowing spirit that knows no boundaries. To me, it sounds promising to recall that God gives power where we least expect to find it and consistently to those who are otherwise, by the terms of this world, completely and utterly powerless. And I, for one, am grateful for this river of grace and healing and love. And I want to encourage you to be grateful too, to offer thanks for all that God does for us as he sends his son, a river of love and grace and healing, to flow through us, to flow among us, to be with us. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. The people of Israel crossed the river Jordan to make their way into the promised land, and Naaman washed himself seven times in that same river. A river flows out from beneath the temple, bringing healing water wherever it goes. And in the new Jerusalem, the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flows from the throne of God and of the Lamb. A river is everything. We're nearly everything. There is a river, the streams whereof make glad the city of God. And that river's name is Jesus. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.